What Hello, is happening, Jesus, Jesus Church. Church friends, family? Man, mm-hmm. I hope everybody's having a great Sunday, Definitely. that you've had a great week, and that just you are ready and raring and excited for today's service because mm-hmm. it's going to be a great one. I am not alone today. I am with a very special person in my life, and that is my wife. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yes, indeed. This is a man who finds a wife or he finds a good thing. You see? <laughs> good things are happening. Yeah. Man, I hope you guys have been following us. And if you have not been following us, you have been missing out on some incredible things, especially on social media. But if you have not followed us, where can they follow us? Like? Uh, guys, you guys can follow us on all our social media platforms. Mm-hmm. We are literally on TikTok, we're on mm-hmm. Facebook, we're on Instagram. We are literally just everywhere. everywhere. So you guys can just go and check us out and just like, share, subscribe, just, yeah. Yes, sir. We cannot wait to engage with you guys on social media. Even right now, as we're chatting, as we're speaking, please do engage with us. There's a whole chat area yes, where yeah. you can speak to us. We will definitely reply. But yeah, guys, we are going to go straight into the word. Yeah. And we will see you at the end of the service. God bless you. We love you. Peace. Peace. I know who I am and I know my 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 purpose and I know where I'm going so there's certain things I don't engage in. I do not disagree with the fact of appreciating the fact. Okay. But my disagree my my point of uh, 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 says a uh, 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 <laughs> is that friends man it's sunday again welcome to jesus church guys it is yet again sunday my favorite day of the week as i always say hey i heard me at least he say this a couple of weeks ago and he got it from me but i said it first okay sunday are my favorite day of the week man without a shadow of a doubt just coming into the house of god and just sharing the word of god and just just taking a minute just to reflect on the goodness of God is just amazing, guys. Um, well, we have been on this sermon series for the last couple of weeks called Focus on Love. And if you have not seen that, guys, please do me a favor, go back and check out all the sermon series, all the episodes that mainly see. And of course, me and Raps spoke about when it comes to the topic of love. But next week, we are going to enter into a new sermon series. So just be excited about that because it's going to be awesome you guys know it like there's always just some exciting stuff he's already shared with us what the new sermon series is but i'm not going to divulge too much right now because it is going to be incredible he announced it at our staff meeting this weekend we just got excited just by him mentioning the title of the sermon series so i really hope you guys are going to enjoy it and i really hope that you guys are going to be blessed by it but hey stay tuned because next week he will be announcing that so you may be asking okay we just finished the sermon series last week next week is going to be a new sermon series so what are we speaking about today well guys it is youth month it is the month where we cherish and value our young people so today's sermon is basically going to be just tailored around that but speaking about young people guys i just want to say thank you to each and every single person who came through for redirect on thursday the 16th of june we had an awesome time if you missed it i'm sorry but hey you can come again next week i mean next year not next week but it was incredible man thank you to everybody that came through thank you to the guys that came from joburg thank you to the guys that helped with food thank you to everybody who was involved in the organizing and just thank you in general to everybody who was there because it was incredible god spoke so much wisdom we bounced ideas from each other we bounced topics from each other and we just received not just from the people from us who was preaching but even from the people that were there there's so much wisdom when young people just gather together and speak about life and speak about what they experienced speak about what god said to them and their purposes and it was incredible man passions were unlocked we prayed for each other so listen do join us next time for redirect but hey redirect doesn't end here we continue with it it is our official youth ministry so look out for stuff for our content on social media a couple of things that are going to be happening during the week when it comes to that so yeah man exciting time for jesus church guys but yeah we are speaking about the youth and there is one 
specific person in the Bible who just epitomizes and illustrates how it's like being young and having talent and having giftings but going through the most and for me that is joseph and i love joseph not just because of his stamina and his tenacity and his bravery but because it's just somebody who was so um, um symbolic of what young people deal with today and we're going to be speaking a bit about him today um so the story starts off like this if you guys don't know it joseph first has a dream right God tells Joseph that he will one day be in a place of rulership, but he tells him this through a dream. He shows him some sheaves in the field, that um, because that time they were farmers, so he shows him some sheaves that surrounded around him. He was the one particular sheaf which was in the middle of the rest of the sheaves who were bowing down to him. And then he wakes up and makes the mistake of going to tell his brother. So he tells his brothers about this dream. And when he tells his brothers about the dream, actually they begin having animosity towards him, not just because of the dream, but because he was actually his father's favorite and he was treated differently as opposed to all the other brothers. So Genesis 3, Genesis 37, 7 says, this is, this is Joseph telling his brothers about the dream. He says, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheave rose up, stood upright while your sheep gathered and, and bowed down to mine. So he was really telling his brothers, I'm going to be in a place of authority one day. And one day you guys are going to actually come and bow down to me. But the interesting thing about the scripture is this. He knows he's going to be an authority over his brothers. He knows that he's going to rule over his brothers. But he doesn't know exactly what, where, or how that's going to happen. Because Joseph actually has this dream when he was 17 years, years old. And I want to speak to a couple of young people today. How many of you guys out there know that you are called for something great? You know that you are called for greatness, but you just don't, don't exactly know what exactly that is. And you're facing challenges right now and you're facing obstacles right now that you maybe feel like, Lord, maybe you got it wrong. Maybe this is what wasn't right. You gave me a dream two years, three years, four years ago. You gave me a dream. You gave me a desire. You gave me a passion and you gave me the giftings that align with what you call me to, but I'm not seeing what you have called me to. I'm looking around my situation. I'm looking around my environment, but I don't see anything that aligns to what you said about me. So here's my point. Here's one thing that I just want to um, um, illustrate is this, that it's going to be tough sometimes when God gives you anything that God gives you to do will always be opposed. Any word that God gives you will always be challenged. Any cha any. Thing that God tells you to do will be opposed. But I want to tell you this. Don't give up on the dream. Don't give up on what God has called you to do. Don't give up on what you know you are created to do, on what God has called you to do, on your giftings. Don't throw it away because God is still at work in your life with this. Now, here's an interesting point. What I found out about the scripture is this. That the brothers didn't actually hate David, I mean Joseph. They actually hated the dream that he stood for. How do we know this? Because if you read the scriptures further, you'll find out that there was a time when Joseph's father actually sends Joseph to go and look for his brothers while they were tending to the sheaves and find out how they were doing and bring word back to him as to how they are doing. So Joseph goes and he goes looking for his brothers and eventually finds his brothers. And while he was walking to his brothers from a distance, his brothers actually see him and they start conspiring to kill him. Imagine this, like they see him coming from a distance and they start conspiring and planning to actually kill him. They say amongst each other, they say, here comes the dreamer. Let's tie him up and kill him and let's see what happens to his dream. They don't say, let's, buy, let's just tie him up and kill him. No, they say, let's tie him and kill him and then we'll see what happens to his dreams. So the assassination was actually not on Joseph. The assassination and the plot was actually to try and kill Joseph. So Genesis 37, 10 says, when he told his father as well, his father, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you've had? Will your mother and father and brother, will your mother and brothers actually come bow down to you, to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So 
Joseph tells his, his, his father as well about the dream and even his father rebukes him. Never mind that his brothers don't like him. Now his father is also rebuking him of the dream. And how many of you guys out there are facing that? Within your family, you know that you are called for something, but in your family, nobody believes in you. Nobody encourages you. Nobody actually accepts the dream that you have because for them, it looks impossible. Sometimes what I discover, friends, is this. That sometimes the biggest discouragement will come from the people close to us. And my point is this, be careful of who you tell your dreams to. Be careful of who you tell your purpose to, what God has called you to. Because the, the easiest time to break or destroy anything is when it's still in the development phase. The, the, the easiest time to kill anything is when it's still in a baby stage. So while God is developing you, while God is building you up for what he's called you to do, keep that in mind. Don't just share your dreams and aspirations with everybody because not everybody is going to believe in what you believe. Not everybody is going to believe that they can achieve what you can achieve. So just be careful and protect your dream. So fast forward in the story, what happens is Joseph comes to his brothers. His brothers tie him up. They throw him in something called a cistern. Now, most people think that he was thrown into a well, but actually he was thrown into something called a cistern, which is actually a man-made um, thing that they would dig into the ground and it was developed and built in a way that it would be able to collect rainwater whenever it rained. So they threw, him, they threw him in there and they went on their way to go and have lunch. And while they were sitting there, they saw, the Bible says that in Genesis 37, so they so they saw they saw a group of Midianites coming in a in kind of like a, a convoy on the way to Egypt going to sell and do business. So this is what they say to each other, right? So when the, when the Midianites merchants came by, what they did is they pulled Joseph out of the cistern and they sold him as a slave to the Midianites. Now here's my here's another point. Can you imagine what was going through Joseph at that time? Can you imagine the heartbreak? Can you imagine the pain that you guys are supposed to be my brothers? You guys are supposed to love me. You guys are supposed to support me. But here you are trying to kill me. If you know the story, a couple of years later when Joseph actually is governor over Egypt, when his brothers actually come there to come looking for grain, what happens is every single time Joseph speaks to them, he speaks to them through an Egyptian interpreter. And the Bible says that he couldn't spend more than about 30 minutes speaking to them because every single time he would see them, he would actually start becoming emotional and he would go away to go and cry and lament over what they did. So this tells us how much this time in Joseph's life had actually broken his heart. It tells us how deep the scar is. It tells us how much he was hurt. And I want to ask somebody today, have you told your dream to somebody who not only rebuked you of that dream, but also started disconnecting from you. You know what I found sometimes, friends, is this, that sometimes when you tell a person about something that they look like it's unachievable or it's impossible, they become very, they become very angry or defensive towards you because that's a direct reflection and it's a direct light on the level of what they believe when it comes to God. When somebody, for example, let's say this, if you are working in a company with somebody, and you believe you're a promotion and that person is not. And you keep telling this person, man, one day I'm going to make it in this company. One day I'm going to own this company. I'm going to move up. I'm going to work hard. And that person starts rebuking you. Sometimes the rebuke does not come because they're just rebuking you. Sometimes it comes because it's a direct reflection and it shed, shed some light on their lack of faith. So sometimes people will hate you because of that. And you need to be okay with that. You can't wait for people to understand. You can't wait for people to get your dream before you move. You can't wait for everybody to co-sign on what you are going after for you to go after it. You just need to continue holding on to the word of God and continue running after it. Now, can you imagine this? Joseph is on his way to Egypt, right? He's on his way to what we now know that that was the land in which he would be governor over second only to Pharaoh. He's literally on his way there, but he's on his way in the in, she, in chains and shackles. He's on his way to the land that he will rule over, but he's on his way there in the form of a slave. So probably just let's just draw a picture around this time, because 
we sometimes skip over the humanity of people or characters in the Bible when actually the true heart and intention of God is in their character and their humanity and not just in what they do. So can you imagine this? Joseph is on his way to Egypt. He's in chains and shackles. And he's going to a foreign land where he's never been. He's detached from his family, taken from his father who loves him. And he's on his way there. Can you imagine what he's thinking about God at this time? Can you imagine what he's thinking about his dream at this time? I mean, maybe he's probably saying to, some, to himself like, Nah, Lord, this is not it. You told me that I'm going to become something great. But yet here I am taken from my family, sold by people who were supposed to, to love me, and I'm on my way to a land that I've never been to. Maybe, Lord, you got it wrong. Maybe, maybe I just had a random dream. Maybe, maybe this is not it for me. And how many of you guys have been in that situation? How many of you guys have been in a situation where you know that you are, God has called you to something, but on your way there, you keep you keep getting into obstacles and situations and you have to go to places or move somewhere and everything around you does not look like what God has promised you that he's going to be, bring you into. So he's on his way to Egypt and he's on his way to Egypt as a slave. See, the thing that Joseph's brothers did was an evil act against him. And God does not condone evil. But Genesis um, 50 to 20 says, when, when Joseph was in, was, in, was in Egypt and his brothers came to look for, for food, this is what he said to, to them. Many years later, this is what he said to them. For you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So Joseph saw God's hand through the evil act that they did. And that's, my, that's, that's one thing that we need to do as young people. We need to be able to see the hand of God in the obstacles and challenges that we go through. Even when people hate us and are conspiring and are conspiring to backstab you or sabotage you, listen, God is still with you. And he can still use your situation for good. So Joseph gets to Egypt and he's sold to a man named Potiphar. Now Potiphar was the general of, of the gods who actually were guard over the palace. So he was in charge of all the soldiers that worked within the palace, all the soldiers that, that protected Pharaoh. So Joseph is sold to this guy. So in Genesis 39, 2-4 to says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his, his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did. So his master saw, Potiphar saw that Joseph, that the Lord was with Joseph. But here's one question. How is it possible for the Lord to be with Joseph, but yet Joseph is a slave? How is it possible that God is still with Joseph? But yet Joseph is still in a position of slavery. And here's the answer to that. See, sometimes it's not about the situation that you're in, but it's about the one who is with you in that situation. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. So it's not about where you are. It's about who is with you when you're there. So even if you're in a situation right now that seems distressed, that seems horrible, if God is with you, then you have everything that you need to thrive and succeed, succeed in that environment. Look, so in the olden times, right? In the olden times, this is what the Israelites used to do when they were walking through the wilderness to go to the land that God had promised them. God instructed Moses to build something called a tabernacle. Now, what a tabernacle is was called the tent of the Lord. That's where the Lord's presence would reside in. Now, it was, it was separated in different sections, but the final and last section within the tabernacle was called the Holies of Holies. And within the Holies of Holies, you found something called the Ark of the Covenant. 
And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And within the Ark of the Covenant, you found three things. You found the rod of Aaron, which actually still produced flowers and budded, even though it wasn't connected to a tree source, symbolizing supernatural miracles. You found the Ten, the ten Commandments, which were actually carved on the pillar by Moses, symbolizing the Word of God. And the third thing that you found in there was the bowl of manna, which is what God was using to feed Israel while they were crossing the wilderness, which, which represented supernatural provision. So all these things are found within the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of Covenant was this golden box which represented God's presence. So what do I mean? I mean this, that if God is with you, you have provision, supernatural miracles. God works a miracle wherever you are. That's why Joseph was able to prosper in the house. You have supernatural provision, so you never lack, right? And you have the Word of God, so God's Word is within you. He speaks to you. He communicates with you. So now this, this particular thing was found in a place within the tabernacle called the Holies of Holies. And this entire thing was built in a desert. Now, how can a tent built in the desert be declared as holy? See, it's not about where it was. It was about who was within it, wherever it was. Maybe a better way to explain it to you guys would be this. Moses in the wilderness. God approaches Moses in the wilderness in the form of a burning bush. I know a lot of us know the scripture. God approaches Moses in the wilderness in the form of a burning bush. And he says to him, take off your shoes for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So he's telling him that where you are standing right now is holy, not because of the area or the place, but because of my presence where it is. And my point is after seeing all this is this. For as long as the presence of God is with you, then you will prosper wherever you are. Even if it's in a situation that seems like it's horrible. Even if you're working in a job right now where you feel stuck and you feel like people are against you and people are backstabbing you. For as long as the Lord's presence is with you, you will prosper in that area. And I don't mean prosper in a sense of finances. I don't mean prosper in a sense of possessions. I mean prosper in what God has created you or positioned you or purposed you to do in that season. So Joseph is prosperous in the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar leaves everything that he has in the hands of Joseph. And Joseph begins managing over everything. Genesis 39, uh, 5 to 6 says, The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. This was because of Joseph, because of the presence of God within Joseph. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except what he ate. What does this mean, friends? This means that though Joseph is a slave, but now he has risen up into a position of authority within Potiphar's house. He has risen up to a position of leadership. He has risen up to a position of managerial, of managing over all of Potiphar's house, even though he's a slave. So he is in a place of authority. Genesis 36, 8 to 10 says, so this one day Joseph is coming into the house of Potiphar to do his job like he always does. And when he gets there, um, Joseph, uh, Potiphar's wife tries to make advances on him. So she tries to get him to sleep with him, with her. Because the Bible says that Joseph was very good looking. He was a very good looking young man. And now Potiphar's wife begins starting to make these inappropriate approaches to her. And she begins trying to sleep with her, with him. Now, a very interesting point is this, that what made her think that it was okay to ask Joseph, who is a slave, to go and sleep with her? Probably this was a very regular custom that she would do in this house. Probably this is something that she had been doing and been doing to other slaves too. And probably this is something that the slaves used to allow her to do with them. My point is this. When you get into an environment where everybody is acting out of character to what God has called you to do or be like, do you adjust or do you conform 
to the ways that they're doing in there. A better way to, to ask you is this. If you enter into a company where people are gossiping against each other or speaking negatively against you, people are forming cliques and forming this and this, do you conform to the ways of that company? Do you conform to the ways wherever it is maybe that you're studying? Do you conform to the ways wherever it is maybe you are working? Or do you stand flat-footed on God's word? Or do you stand flat and firm on what God has told you? See, this, I think this is a problem that a lot of young people have is this, that we are easily swayed by people's opinions. We are easily drawn away from what God has called us to do or God has called us to be or God or us representing God in our social circles because we want to fit in so much. We are always trying to fit in with crowds that we lose ourselves. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, um, a man who does not have self-control is like a house without walls. What this means, let me show you a picture right quick. If you are living in a house without a wall, then the temperature of that house it, it, it is dependent upon the environment outside. So if it's cold outside, it will be cold inside. If it's hot outside, it will be hot inside. So the environment is not determined by what's inside. It's determined what's outside. So if you do not have self-control, then whenever, wherever you are, your character and your integrity will be determined by what is happening outside, what people are saying. If they are gossiping, if they're slandering each other, you will take on their character. So as young people, we need to come to a place where we are still so steadfast on God's word, that we are so steadfast on the prince of God within us, that we refuse to conform to the ways of this world. So she says this to her, and Joseph says to her, Joseph says this to him, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted in my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He was starting by describing Potiphar, but then at the end of it, he says, how then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So he's not actually talking about Potiphar. He's talking about the presence of God that's within him. He's saying that I am not going to conform to this. I am not going to conform to these ways. I am not going to do this because God is the one who placed me here and I'm not going to sin against him. See, what was happening in this place is that the enemy was literally trying to separate Joseph from God. It wasn't about what he was going to do. It was about what, what he was about to do was going to do within him. If he had sinned against God, then the presence of God was going to be removed from him. Because we serve a God who is perfect and he cannot associate himself with sin. For God to be within us, we need to be holy. Holy means that we are set apart for his use. Meaning that the things that other people do, we do not do because we are set apart. We are consecrated. So if he conformed to this, then the, the enemy knew that if Joseph is to sleep with her, then she, I can separate him from the prince of God. And if I can separate him from the prince of God, then I can get to everything else. Chances are Potiphar's wife was, be was beautiful. Chances are she was, because Egyptians women were actually one of the most beautiful women in, 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 in that area of time at that time. So had he given in to this, the agenda and the aim was to separate him from God. Friends, I want to speak to each and every single young person who's listening to me right now. Do not conform to the standards of this world. Do not conform to the standards of your social circles. Do not conform to the standards, even I dare say in your family, if they are doing things that are against God's will. 
So we know how the story goes. Joseph unfortunately ends up in jail anyway because Potiphar's wife, when he refuses to sleep with her, he runs away and she actually grabs a piece of his garment which tears off and then Joseph runs away. He flees from sexual temptation. He flees from sexual sin. He runs away. And then what happens is this. Potiphar's wife goes to Potiphar with the garment and he says, look, the slave that you um, employed in your house tried to sleep with me. He tried to rape me. Bible says that Potiphar gets angry and they send Joseph to jail. Literally, Joseph now is just in, in a dungeon. And, and friends, this was actually more gruesome and more horrible than we think it was because the dungeons in, this in those times were found underground. They, they, wrote, they, they, they read sewerage. Sewerages used to run through those dungeons. So it was a smelly place and rats were there and it was just unsanitary and it was horrible. Now, can you imagine Joseph back again in this? Can you imagine how he thinks right now? Can you imagine what's going through his mind? Like, I didn't do anything. I, I kept your ways, Lord. I, I kept my integrity, Lord. I kept my eyes on you and I just did what I could do and I was faithful to you. But then how is it that I am here? How is it that I'm not, not, at least as a slave, I was at least kind of free. At least I had favor with, with, my, with my master. But now I am literally in prison. I am in jail and I did nothing wrong. And how many of us feel like that? How many, how many of us feel like we are stuck even though we are trying to do everything right? Even though we read our word every day, we pray every day, we seek God's face. But yet nothing seems like in our life is moving forward. How many of us feel like that? How many of us are in an environment right now where we just want to throw in the towel? We come, we show up every day, we work hard every day, but nothing seems to be going on. In fact, it seems like we are going backwards because things just are not working out for us. Some of us even may think that we are cursed. So he is in prison and he's unfairly accused. But check, look at this. Something very interesting happens. Genesis 39, 22, 23 says, So the warden, the warden put, so the warden of the prison put Joseph in charge over all that he had in prison. And he was made responsible over all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. How can the Lord be with me if I'm in jail right now? My friends, I want to tell you something, that God is still with you. If you find yourself in the situation that I'm, that I'm speaking about right now, where you just feel like you're stuck, He is still with you. And the reason why we know that God was with Joseph is because Joseph begins getting favor in the warden's eyes. My point is this. Don't stop using your gift. See, one gift that Joseph had was that he could manage very well. He could manage whatever you gave Joseph to do, he would manage that and multiply it. That's what made him gain favor with Potiphar, and that's what made him gain favor with the prison water. Fast forward later, um, the king of Egypt at that time is offended by his chief cupbearer and his chief baker, and they are sent to the prison where Joseph was. And at that time, even though Joseph has been there the longest, the prison water actually makes Joseph to be the one who serves, not the one who's getting served, the one who serves the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. See, the mere fact that Joseph was not an Egyptian put him in a lower place than any other Egyptian that was in Egypt's region. So even when you're in jail, you are still treated better than the Egyptian. I mean, they still treat the Egyptians better than they treat you because you are not an Egyptian. So this was a very unfair situation. And my question is this to you guys. Can you continue serving when the situation seems unfair? Can you continue be having integrity? Can you continue serving at whatever place that you are working at? Can you continue going there even when the situation seems unfair? Never mind, never mind the fact that it was unfair, but three years later, three years later, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker are set free from prison 
and Joseph is left there. The Bible says that it had actually been a while while Joseph was in prison before the chief cupbearer and the chief baker were sent to prison. So they found him there. Two years later, they are set free and they leave him there. <laughs> and the way that they leave him there is this, that one day the chief cupbearer and the chief, and the chief baker have a dream. Joseph, because he's the one that's serving them the next morning, comes to them and sees that they are sad. And he asks them, why are you guys so sad? And they tell him the dream, their dreams, and he interprets them. And after interpreting them, the Bible says that one of the dreams was that in two days, the Pharaoh is going to forgive you and you guys are going to leave uh, the prison. So they leave prison. Joseph's interpretation spot on is true. And they leave prison. They go back into serving the king. And Joseph is left in prison. Friends, how many of you guys feel so stuck in your life right now that you keep even seeing people coming into the environment that you are and they even look like they're surpassing you? How many of you guys scroll on social media and see your friends look like, look like they're doing better than you? People are getting jobs. People are getting record deals. People are getting promotions. People are getting married. People are getting such and such. And you still feel like you're stuck. But Joseph does not stop serving. He doesn't stop being faithful. He doesn't stop being humble. And two years later, the king of Egypt actually has a dream. Whereas he has a dream because Joseph interpreted um, the, king, the chief baker's dream in prison. The chief baker was there when the king was calling all his officials and all his mag magicians to come and try to interpret the dream that he had, but they couldn't. And eventually the chief cupbearer tells the king, who's Pharaoh, that when I was in prison, there was a boy who interpreted my dream. Maybe he can come and interpret your dream. And the Bible says, I think let's read it. In Genesis 41, 14, it says, So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. The Bible says quickly. Why am I emphasizing this word quickly? Because that's how quickly God can change your situation. It only takes one phone call. It only takes one email. It only takes one, one person. Quickly. His situation was changed. And we know what happens. He interprets the king's dream. The dream was somewhat like the king had a dream about seven cows that came out of the river that were fat and seven cows that came out of the river that were skinny. And the, the skinny cows actually ate the fat cow. So Joseph interprets the dream and he says, the first seven cows represented seven years of abundance within the land. But the, the second set of seven cows actually represented seven years of in, 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 in severe famine within the land. So he interprets this dream, that dream and another dream, which is similar to the first one, and the interpretation was actually the same. He interprets these dreams, and after interpreting these dreams, he begins to tell Pharaoh what to do. He says, appoint men in all the regions of Egypt that in the seven years of abundance, they can collect some grain and some resources so that when the seven years of famine hit, there will be resources that will allow the, the land to continue living. And after telling Pharaoh this, Pharaoh decides to put Joseph as governor over all of Egypt. The Bible says that he puts him as governor over all of Egypt and he actually takes off his ring, which is actually a, a, a sign of authority. And he takes off his ring and he puts it on Joseph's finger. And from that day on, Joseph started ruling only second to Pharaoh in the region of Egypt. That quickly... God can change your situation. Don't stop believing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop hoping. Don't stop having faith in Him. Because you know what? The time that Joseph, that Joseph spent serving in Potiphar's house and the time that Joseph spent serving in the prison were actually developing Joseph for a higher level of what he was already doing in these two, in two places. So God takes Joseph out of the out of prison quickly and he puts him in charge over all of Egypt. Quickly, in one day, God can turn your situation around. See, for Joseph to have to go through all these years of serving and all these years of working and believing and having faith in God, 
was because God was preparing him to rule over Egypt. And he had to be able to carry those responsibilities. See, sometimes when we ask God for more, he has to increase our ability to carry more. And the increasing of our ability to carry more sometimes looks very repetitious. There's a story, there's, there's actually a very beautiful scripture in Matthew 11, I think, that says, where God is saying that, are you tired of religion? He says, come to me. He says, keep company with me. And I will teach you the rhythms of my grace. He says, I will not put anything heavy on you. But my, 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 my highlight in the scriptures, he says, I will teach you the rhythms of my grace. See, grace has a rhythm. And the rhythm of grace looks like you coming every day. You are, you, 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 you attending every day. You showing up every day. You, you, you coming to work every day, even though it's not comfortable. You showing up to school every day, even though it's tough. You showing up to your family or people that need you, even though you feel like they're abusing you. So he says every day, like show up. It's a repeat. It's a repeat. It's a repetitive thing. A rhythm is re is repetitive. There's a there's a there's a repetitiveness to a rhythm. And when the when a rhythm becomes better is when another rhythm comes into it so all of a sudden there's a rhythm and it keeps on growing and it keeps on getting more and more but for that to happen it has to repeat over and over and over again so my point is this friends don't stop showing up don't stop believing don't stop trusting don't stop holding on to god's word something that melissa always says he says hold on to the last word that god told you until he gives you a new one Friends, I hope that somebody's encouraged and I hope that every young person that I'm talking to today will be encouraged by what I'm saying and I hope that you guys are going to be entering into this new week, into this new time, into this new level of your life with increased trust in God. If, if, if there's anything that I've said today that should stick is this, that keep trusting God because He is still with you. Friends, I hope that you guys have a great week and i hope that you guys just have a great time have a productive one i love you we love you see you next week god bless you peace hello friends i hope you you're doing well i hope um you know you have actually i were actually blessed and um encouraged by the word that was preached i always say that a word that challenges changes you right um and and i've realized that every word that's preached here it's super challenging and gives a new brand new perspective of a, a scripture that we probably have known and um we've been reading for the, for the very longest time so we're going into the time of offering right and i have a story here that um really encouraged me when i was uh reading and studying it and just going more into it right and i realized that we actually cannot give in the house of the lord we cannot give something that we don't really have right uh god can also challenge you with probably the very last thing that you had um that when you want when you have to give it away it's challenging for you it's you want to you want to give it but want to hold it back right um and i came through this amazing scripture of um when jesus when when the five thousand people were fed the person who um, brought the fish and the bread forth it was something that he had at that point in time and he believed that this is not only for me but i'd rather have to give it to the people and he never imagined that those uh, is two loaves of bread and five fish, uh, five loaves of bread and two fishes that he presented would really feed a nation. A five thousand. Imagine from two and five, right? And it got multiplied and it fed the nation. Five thousand. So the Bible says in Mark six verse forty. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven jesus christ gave thanks and broke the loaves 
and then he gave them to his disciples um, to the people to the to the disciples to distribute to the people he also divided the fish among them all verse 42 they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basket full basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish the number of men who had eaten was 5000 and my question to you friends is what is it that you're presenting for to God that can feed the nation not only in you know in food but rather uh, reaching out to the world um because i mean like for us to do what we're doing it's through your giving right what are we doing to spread out the, the gospel right um and one other point is that that i got from from the scripture is to show you, you that the meals that we brought to were brought to be multiplied when not only for one person but it was to feed the people right I can guarantee you this friends through your giving your faithful giving and i want to i want to appreciate we want to appreciate actually those who have been been faithful in their giving in their tithes and offering that your giving really does make a difference it's very impactful we're able to you know have by the lights cameras and you know being able to spread out the gospel to the nations and it does touch one two three a uh, couple of people out there and we're re receiving great news from people and my my last one that i want to leave with you friends is what do you have that could feed the five thousand? Friends, it doesn't have to be much. It doesn't have to be much. But what you have and what you can give to the house of the Lord to, to be able to maintain the, us being able to spread the gospel, it means a lot. Not to the church, but to someone else out there. With your seed, I want us to, to pray. Let us pray for the seed that you're about to put into the house of the Lord. And I believe that as you giving, one soul has been touched. Um, and we don't only give because we have, but we also give because we are blessed. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray. Um, if you're giving through an EF, EFT, our bank, our bank details are showing up right there on your screen. There's also a Zepa code. Just do me a favor, download the Zepa app so they can be able to, um, uh, to, to scan the code and be able to give into the house of the friends. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, but Daddy, your people are about to give into the storehouse so that there may be plentiful of food in the storehouse and we want to pray with them father god that touch their hearts and father god jehovah is the giving to the storehouse lord jehovah they're not only giving mighty god because mighty god jehovah they, they give because you bless them father god father god jehovah in the name of jesus and those who are unable who cannot give father god we're praying father god give them the means to give into the storehouse father god father we thank you we give all the glory the honor and the adoration in jesus name we've prayed and let the people of god say amen friends thank you very much we appreciate you we love you guys so yeah we've come to the end of the service friends we love you um and we pray that you have a great week let, let me let me send off with a prayer father we thank you we give all the glory mighty god jehovah in the name of jesus we thank you for the great word we thank you for the people who have given into your storehouse we thank you for those mighty god who are encouraged and blessed by the word that was preached today father god we, we glorify your name Mighty God, as we go out and starting off a new week, Father God, be with us, O Lord, O King of Glory. In Jesus' name, and we pray, Father God, your favor and might get to be upon us, Father God, and strengthen us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we've prayed and let the people of God say amen and amen. Friends, we'll see you guys um, for our Insta Live on Mondays. Every Monday, we have our Insta Live at 7 p.m. Do not miss out. Cheers, friends.